and CEC to install uh, Middle Tennessee's first example of a regenerative stormwater conveyance at Nolansville High School, which is in the headwaters of Mill Creek. Um, so this is an opportunity for us to help push that leading edge of how communities, businesses, and individuals can improve water quality. Another upcoming opportunity you might be interested in is we have a stream restoration workshop that will be taking place in Murfreesboro. And this is to look at techniques for small scale um, stream restoration and bank stabilization. So that's a two day workshop partnering with North Carolina State University. Uh, but back to what we're doing here today. Uh, we're excited to have CEC and Steve with us. Um, unfortunately, Christine Guy Baker um, is feeling under the weather, so she's not able to be here, but she played a huge part and continues to play a huge part in what Steve is gonna talk about today. So you'll see a lot of Christine's work throughout this presentation. Uh, Steve works as the CEC Nashville office lead, and much of his career has been in the water resources field, particularly focusing on hydrology and hydrologic, um, hydraulic modeling, MS4 compliance, erosion prevention and sediment control, and MPDES permitting. He also has experience in a range of civil and environmental engineering fields, such as solid waste management, civil and site development, and wastewater treatment. And he helps to support a wide variety of services offered within the Nashville office. So please join me in welcoming Steve. Thank you all uh, for being here. Get this a little closer. Yeah. Um, yeah, Christine was going to give this presentation. Um, and uh, I was going to help out, but I'm happy to be here. I'm sorry she's not feeling great. I feel like I should, I guess I can stand here or stand up here. I don't know if I'm interfere with that mic or not. If there's a lot of feedback, I'll jump away. Um, Thank you for being here. I know there's several online as well, and uh, welcome y'all. I do want to just some housekeeping stuff. Um, do we want to talk about the, the like restrooms, things like that? Everybody know where the restrooms are? Just out here, kind of on the way out that you came in the front door on the right. Um, we got emergency exits, um, two of those, and. I guess the other thing I wanted to just point out too, if you have questions during this presentation, um, please interrupt me and ask them. I think I would like this to be more of a dialogue than just a presentation. And I'll do my best to repeat your question for the benefit of those in the live stream so that they can participate as well. Um, do we have a way of live stream participants asking questions? I just want to check on that. I forgot to ask that I earlier. So we'll okay, okay, got it. Okay, so I've got about 20, a little less than 25 slides, um, and I'm going to go through these uh, uh, really at a, whatever pace we end up having questions for. Um, and really the goal of this is uh, to help maybe pull back some of the layers of the land disturbance permitting process in Hendersonville. And I know there's several of you here that are from other MS4s. There's designers. Yeah, just raise a hand. Who are designers in the room? Just curious. Okay, got it. Now I think I know the MS4s in the room. Um, but y'all can raise your hands too, though. Who are the MS4s in the room? Okay, that's what I thought. Got it. Um, you know, this is all about a communication process between designers and MS4s trying to meet the requirements of an ordinance or a resolution that is th that resolution or ordinance is required by a state level NPDES permit that is ultimately mandated by EPA. And so the reason we're here today is hopefully to shed some light on how to improve that communication process between designers and regulators all around this MS4 permit. So up here is just some excerpts and kind of summaries of what the current MS4 permit has to say about land disturbance permitting processes. And really, all MS4s right now, because of when this permit was finalized and the process for getting ramping up to the requirements of this new permit, not all of the MS4s are fully meeting this at this point, particularly this last point here about the. Uh, 
new Tennessee rule regarding permanent stormwater management. So the MS4 permit that we're currently under was finalized last fall, September 1st, if I'm not mistaken. And then there's a two-year process, up to two-year process, before you even come into this full compliance of meeting that rule. Some MS4s decided to go one year, some in between, okay? You fall off here. But the point is not to say, oh, we don't have to do this yet. The point here is, even under the last permit, there were requirements to review plans and to make sure that they actually met their design intent and most importantly, met the intent of the stormwater ordinance, okay? And that is different than when you get a notice of coverage from the state, there is not an engineering level review done of your stormwater pollution prevention plan. It's written right there in their cover letter. The MS4s do that extra level of review. That's the way, that's the way it is right now. Still means you have, I mean, unless you're a qualified local program, which Hendersonville is not, you've got to get both permits if you're going to disturb more than an acre of land. Okay? So many of you in the room are aware, you know, most projects in Hendersonville that we have been involved with are over an acre of disturbance, meaning they had to go get a notice of coverage under the construction dental permit from the state, as well as a land disturbance permit from the city of Hendersonville. Okay? Okay, can everybody read that? Yeah, it's an eye chart. I, I get it. But this is really to show, and thank you, Helen, for sending me this. This is a, just a flow chart of what goes on in Hendersonville to get a land disturbance permit. Okay? I'm, gonna, I'm not going to dwell on this a long time, but I do want to point out that this first part up here in the top left is getting your plans pulled together filling out the checklist, paying the fees, and submitting all of that, okay? There's a sufficiency review that's done by the city to see that, you know, those things are done. The, check, the boxes are checked, if you will. After that is when we as CEC get involved in reviewing the plans, okay? Um, and we're reviewing the plans by looking at that checklist primarily, but also we're looking at good civil engineering practices as well, right? And as a I'm a design engineer as well. Um, I have to send in plans and have cities and counties review them and give me comments. I get it's not the most fun process, um, but if, if I could give one word of advice, um, if you don't hear anything else today, I would say just take one, have someone that hasn't been involved in the plans development, look at your plans before they go out the door. Um, because it's, I get there's, sometimes there's going to be technical comments, but um, there's some comments that we have where it was just, it, it's not right because it wasn't checked. It's a typo. It's, it's something like that. So I would just say just, have someone else look at the plans before they get sent out because once we get involved, there's a timeline that starts. Uh, we have 10 days, uh, 10 business days is kind of the goal of turning around these reviews. Um, and as you can see, this is just one piece of the puzzle. Okay. Um, Helen, do you want to add anything to this or talk about anything in, in particular? Okay. Okay. All right, and this this is available on the uh, website, right? Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about plan development. Okay. Now, uh, I just realized I have no keyboard <laughs> or mouse to click on any of these. Um, uh, I didn't even think about that. Okay. Can you click on any? Thank you, Jason. Um, let's just, we'll just go down the list if you don't mind. Um, now, what we wanted to do here is just, oops, that's the next slide, I think. There we go. Okay. 
It won't let me. Huh. Okay. Can you right click and try and click open link? No. Okay. Negative. Okay. All right. I'm. I apologize. Um, how many are familiar with the National Wetland Inventory Mapper? Okay, some of you. Uh, this is something that you could Google. This presentation we can also make available as well. Uh, the the mapper is just a desktop review of whether or not you have wetlands on your site. It is not meant to be uh, the final say, okay? But if you pull that up and your site is covered in blue, that should be a red flag to you, okay? Uh, if it's not, that doesn't mean you're out of the woods, okay? It might mean that there are wetlands there and there may be a necessity to go out and actually do a hydrologic determination and find out are these truly wetlands or not. But this is a desktop review to just start the process, okay? It's very easy to do. The next one is the Department of Water Resources, the, the TDEC, Department of Water Resources Construction Stormwater Permitting Map Viewer. Now, that is a, uh, it, it, how many are familiar with the map viewer for uh, permits? Like where you can pull up and see what permits, okay, that's what I thought many of you in here would be. Well, this is a version of that, but it's a lot of the extraneous information has been stripped away. This focuses on siltation impaired streams and siltation impaired watersheds, okay? And so when you pull this up, if you see that your site is in a watershed that is a siltation impaired watershed, and you can tell by looking at the legend on the side, then guess what applies? Anybody wanna guess? What design storm will the erosion control plans be held to? Nope. Good, good guess, though. Five-year. Five-year, 24-hour design storm. Exactly right. If you're not in that watershed, what design storm applies? The two-year. That's right. Now, we're talking, I'm talking about the erosion control plan. I'm not talking about permanent stormwater infrastructure. Okay, that's, that's a separate issue. Okay, we're focused right now on erosion control. So if you were in a siltation impaired watershed, that means the five-year, 24-hour design storm applies. It also means your water quality buffers are not 30 feet, they're 60 feet, right? It also means that if you have an outfall that has more than five acres of drainage to it, you gotta have what at the outfall? Sediment basin, thank you, thank you. A sediment basin, I appreciate the audience participation. Um, it would be a 10 acre threshold if you weren't, right? If you're not in a siltation impaired watershed, okay? Now, those of you who may have been in this for a while may recall, oh, unless I have a direct discharge to a siltation impaired stream, these additional requirements don't apply. Well, TDEC took that gray area out of the equation by saying, look, here's the watershed. If you're in this watershed, and it drains to the siltation impaired stream, those additional requirements apply, okay? Next, the exceptional Tennessee, does somebody have a question? Oh, okay. The exceptional Tennessee waters data viewer, that's not a map, unfortunately. It's just a data viewer, it's a database, right? And it tells you what streams are considered exceptional, okay? Everything I just said about siltation impaired streams applies to exceptional streams. Unfortunately, there's not a watershed like there is with the siltation impaired streams. So there is a little bit more gray area about does this apply to this project or not? If it's a direct discharge, there's no question it applies. If it's not direct, then it may, be, it may require a conversation with TDEC. But I can tell you this, if you discharge into a storm sewer system and that storm sewer system directly discharges to that exceptional Tennessee water, that is very likely going to be considered in a, a direct discharge because there's virtually nothing in between but gray infrastructure, okay? Why am I going through all this? Well, this is how you determine the constraints that you have to design with them, right? So that's, sometimes some of the comments that we send out 
some of these are missed. And so it requires quite a bit of redesign to kind of go back and deal with a wider buffer or adding more sediment basins, that sort of thing. So it's, this is kind of a desktop review before you get there. The USGS stream stats. How many people have used that? Good. Yeah, good. Incredibly useful tool, um, particularly when you're having to come up with a peak flow rate on a stream, right? And that's becoming more and more common as there's more and more unmapped streams that require a hydrologic and hydraulic study to prove compliance with the city's floodplain ordinance. So USGS stream stats can be a really helpful tool in that process. Um, and quite frankly, it's just an easy, it's a nice tool to do culvert design with to get a peak flow. May not be the only thing you do for hydrology, but at least it's a start. Uh, the FEMA Flood Map Service Center, that's where you can look up the flood maps and find out if your project is in a floodplain or a floodway. Um, and then you can look up the effective maps as well as preliminary maps that have been issued as draft but are under review. Um, it's very good to know that because a lot of cities, I mean Hendersonville too, they take that into account. If there's an area that's not in the floodplain but it will be, assuming those maps get adopted, then it's good to plan for that. Okay. The Rare Species Data Viewer. This is a database. It's not a map. Um, David Withers can probably speak a lot more eloquently about this than I can, right? <laughs> but this is where you can find out about um, rare species like the streamside salamanders presence um, in or near your project, okay? Um, Certainly the stormwater ordinance, that's available at the city's website. You should be familiar with that. And by the way, that stormwater ordinance will be revised. Uh, that, along with all the other Tennessee MS4s that fall under the general MS4 permit, they're all in the process at some point of revising their ordinances to line up with the new permit that came out last fall. Okay, but the current ordinance is in effect right now. Site visit, I cannot overstate the importance of a site visit. Um, please go visit the site before you turn in plans. Um, it's amazing too, not everything's viewable on Google Street View. Okay, some things are, it's a great tool. We didn't put it up here. I think a lot of us are used to using that for a variety of reasons, but it's not a replacement for a site visit. And then occasionally there's a need for a hydrologic determination. But the reason this is up here right now in this due diligence is there is a website. I, don't, I guess we forgot to include the hyperlink for it here. There's a website you can go look up previously done hydrologic determinations that the state has on file. Um, if you're fortunate enough to find one on your site, that's, that's really helpful. Uh, they tend to not be as reliable and I don't know if it's an official thing, maybe David, you can help me with this, but I think after five years, they need to be revisited. Yeah, I've seen some in on the website that are older than five years, but I think they're just there for reference. You'd wanna, uh, that's been a comment that we have had on some plans that we've helped the city review in the past. Um, okay, okay, got it, okay. Yeah, and it's, when I say map viewer, it's not like the same thing as a TDAC map viewer. It's essentially a point on a map that you are able to click on and get the report. And so then you're looking at a PDF of what the qualified hydrologic professional turned into TDAC. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Can you repeat the question and comment? Please? Yes, thank you. Let me repeat the question. The question was about whether this five year sunsetting rule for these uh, hydrologic determinations is written somewhere. Um, and 
sounds like the consensus is we're not sure. Um, I, I can say that in the TDOT work we do, uh, particularly our ecology group, they are asked to revisit reports that they've done that are older than five years um, for this very same reason. So I, it seems to be quite pervasive, this five-year idea, but I do not know where that's written. So I think we can do a little bit more research and maybe circle back. Yeah, Ellen. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So for the benefit of those on the uh, live stream, Helen was just mentioning there's some conversations about shortening that to maybe two or three years rather than five years at the local level. Um, and then having those hydrologic determinations done in the winter time, if at all possible. Um, so I'm guessing that's going to be something during the stormwater ordinance revision process that may get considered further. So that's always a possibility. That's right. That's right. So, but we'll, we'll do our best to circle back on the five-year sunsetting rule um, and try and get some more clarification around that. Okay, so since I can't click on these links, that's not really, this is a really exciting um, slide here. Um, the um, checklist is available on the city's website, and I, I cannot overstate the importance of that checklist. It is a comprehensive checklist. Um, the first link is to the actual checklist. The second link is to the main, the stormwater page that the city has where you can find that checklist as well as the ordinance and other things. Um, but I, I can't overstate the importance of filling out the checklist and where it asks you to state where something is provided to be specific about that. It really helps in the review process. Um, those of you who have received comments from the city note that there's a, often a checklist item referenced whenever the comment is written to say, hey, checklist item 52 or whatever it is. And the idea is we're, we're not trying, oh, look at that. Man, Jason came through, we got it. Okay, um, that's the permit. Uh, did I have the wrong? What's the other uh, hyperlink? Permits. Did you click the first or second one, Jason? I didn't click either. I just found it on our website. Oh, okay. Okay. Got it. Um, yeah, that was the permit application. And then uh, I think he's trying to work on getting the, the checklist here. Uh, but just a couple other things about the checklist. Uh, the checklist was last revised in 2021, I believe. It is often being kind of tweaked as maybe... We're seeing, uh, the city is seeing maybe some misunderstanding consistently about one of the checklist items. Then there's an attempt to try and reword that. Uh, yeah, here we go. Um, and so be, um, uh, be cognizant of that and don't just maybe save one of these to your desktop and keep using it. Go back to the website each time. Make sure you're using the most current checklist. Because that's some of our comments are simply, hey, you need to go back and use this, the right checklist. Um, but as you can see, it's, it's several pages long. Um, it is uh, it kind of walks you through the stages to kind of show what the city's expectations are with regard to what is shown in what stage of uh, erosion control plans. Um, and it, as you can see, it says, where is it located? Where is the information located? Um, and again, the more specific you can be with that, the better. Um, please use this too as just an internal kind of quality assurance review of your own plans. Um, 
Yeah, Dwayne. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. So Dwayne Allen just pointed out here with the city that the biggest time waster in, in his experience has been designers not following this checklist. Um, so this checklist does represent the city's expectations. Um, understanding there's different interpretations about some things in here um, but I would say the ones that go through the quickest provide some maybe some explanatory language around some of these if it's questionable meaning you know a nice descriptive note or maybe um, you know just supporting narrative even written into the checklist kind of you know annotated in the pdf if you will like here's here's what how we're meeting this. It may not be so obvious in the plans. The better communication you provide, the better or the quicker often the permitting process goes. Um, okay. Thank you, Jason. Um, okay. Move on here. All right. Letterman had his top ten. We got our top five. Um, <laughs> I said that to Christine and she was not familiar with David Letterman's top 10. It was just, it was kind of a moment for me. Okay, I do have gray hair. Um, plan and drainage report agreement. Um, I'll show you an example of that. Sediment control calculations. Focusing on the drainage area to a stretch of silt fence, as well as check dam flow capacity and spacing. Design intent, specifically with regard to sequencing notes and details or generic details. Um, stream determinations and then the corresponding floodplain floodway compliance and then sediment basin and sediment trap design. Those are the top five, okay? This first one here, the plans and the drainage report not agreeing. This is probably the most frequent comment that we have and it look i get it as a designer you tweak the design and the plans and maybe it just it doesn't go back through the hydrology and hydraulic software um, or it's just a mistype but as you can see in what's highlighted here it's a fairly minor comment maybe right i mean it we don't know when you don't show on the plans what's being modeled in the drainage report then you can't say that what's the results in the drainage report are actually match what the plans would produce. So just have somebody check this. Um, another thing I will say about this is um, we find a lot when someone has designed a sediment basin and there's a permanent pool in that sediment basin, they won't, uh, air quote, fill that in during, during the modeling. They still count that storage as available for routing uh, in, in the routing, and it's not. It's intended to be filled in, permanent pool, meaning there's no bottom outlet. And so you can't use that during your routing calculations, okay? That's just another frequent example. This is probably the most frequent, though. It's pipe sizes, it's elevations, it's diameters that just don't match what's in the plans, okay? Um, the silt fence calculations. So here's an example here. You know, someone put 2.43 acres of disturbance and uh, did this 2.43 acres times 100 linear feet per quarter acre, which that's the maximum drainage area to 100 linear feet of silt fence, quarter acre. Okay, where does that come from? Is that CEC's opinion? No, that comes from the TDEC. Uh, the, the Tennessee Erosion Sediment Control Handbook, okay? 100 feet of silt fence can take on a quarter acre of drainage, which is a basically a 100-foot square, okay? Well, in this example, someone was saying, well, I've got almost two and a half acres, and I've got uh, nine, I'm, I'm providing over 1,100 linear feet of silt fence. Well, the problem was 
that was done for the entire project. It wasn't looking at, well, do you have over two acres draining to 100 feet of that, and then the rest of it has barely anything draining to it. It wasn't looking at it in a basically a 100-foot segment by segment kind of thing. Okay. Now, um, let me explain that because this is not that. This is a different example on the bottom. Let me say one more thing about the top example. It really comes down to risk, right? What we're trying to convey is that if you've got, um, and I'm thinking, I'm not going to name any names, but I'm thinking of one right now where silt fence was right near a roadway, and there was a lot of drainage coming to that section of silt fence, okay? But not as much coming to other sections of the silt fence. And so for that section, it was way over exceeding the hundred. Uh, or the quarter acre per hundred linear feet. Well, the risk there was great. If that silt fence falls over, silt just goes out into the roadway, okay? Even though if you had done this kind of global calculation, it met the requirement, okay? Now, what we're not asking you to do is to look at, you know, every hundred feet. Look at it holistically and find where's the largest area going to a hundred linear feet of silt fence. And if that's no more than a quarter acre, you're good, right? You don't need to check every single one, but you need to look at the ones that have the high risk downstream issues, okay? On the bottom one here, um, it's kind of the same thing, but it's a different example, but you can see it's, it's silt fence like this that it, it's, um, Coming down, I guess it's coming down. I don't see any labels here. That's how I've interpreted it. It's going in one direction or the other. But the point is, it's two rows. Okay? And so that's how you can break up. If you've got a long slope and there's no way you can meet that quarter acre per hundred feet, then you just add more silt fence. Okay? Or you have the option of putting a more robust sediment control practice like silt fence with backing at the base. And that watershed is actually greater. It can handle more than a quarter acre, okay? I believe it's a half acre per 100 linear feet. So you've got more there, but then you could, if, even if that can't make it, you can put intermediate sections of silt fence. You could also use straw wattles, or TDOT calls them sediment tubes, which gives you a lot of latitude in what you put in those tubes, be it wood chips, tire chips, uh, compost, you know, there's different things you can put in those to break up that slope length, okay? The reason behind all this, you know, why, why does the TDEC EPSC handbook even have this limitation? Well, silt fence is great when it's intercepting sheet flow. I mean, it just works really well. Trenched in, turned up at the ends, it does a great job. When silt fence starts intercepting concentrated flow, it doesn't do so hot. It's just not meant for that, okay? Sheet flow doesn't, you're not gonna have sheet flow very much over 100 feet of drainage, okay? It's gonna start to concentrate. And so in situations like that, you may be, you may need something more than silt fence. You may need to intercept it with a ditch or a diversion berm, send it to a sediment trap, send it to a sediment basin. But silt fence is intended for sheet flow interception, okay? That's the reason there is a drainage area limitation for silt fence. It's also the reason that if you put it, if you stack it up a slope, it tends to work because it's slow, it's providing a small backwater zone every time water has to pass through it. Now I understand from a co contractor's perspective, that's inconvenient because they're working up there, right? And so it does, as a designer, you have to, do your best to try and anticipate that. Maybe even have a conversation with the contractor about how this is going to be constructed and maybe have your notes reflect that. But if you're going to show silt fence with more than a quarter acre draining to any hundred feet, that will elicit a comment. So, um, any questions about this? Any discussion on this? Yeah, Dave? Salamander's present. 
committing to invest. Okay. Okay. That's good. So David Withers just mentioned about streamside salamanders and the compost filled socks uh, actually resembling rotting logs to them and helping with habitat. But then also the concern with properly installed silt fence can actually block migration of uh, or movement of those streamside salamanders. Um, and David, I, I may be misremembering this, but I'm pretty sure I saw an email or a detail or something from you or someone showing a gap in silt fence with silt fence above it to provide pay, basically a pathway for salamanders. Uh, Jay hooks something different, but this was basically, you know, you stop the silt fence so there's an opening here, and then you come up the slope a little bit and put another section of silt fence to essentially shield that gap from sediment loss, but you've provided a pathway then for the salamander. Yeah, so a lot of the population monitoring for this kind of salamander, mm -hmm. uh, silt fence would have to be used to direct them to fence effects, the five gallon bucket. Okay. Just to reiterate what David said for the live stream, silt fence can be a barrier um, because it, I mean, it is a barrier unless uh, it's not been maintained or just through wear and tear. There may be some places for salamanders to come through, but I would put forth it'd be better to maybe plan for that. If you know they're in the area, plan for some gaps in the silt fence, but protect that gap from silt loss um, by putting silt fence just upstream of that gap that kind of overlaps but still provides a pathway uh, for the salamander so good any other discussion about this or any of the anything we've talked about so far you might need to stand up and just kind of get some blood flowing <laughs> okay yes Yeah, uh, so for the uh, benefit of the live stream participants, the question is about a 200 linear feet section of silt fence in which you have a half acre, if I'm understanding you're a half acre draining to that 200 feet, but maybe one half of that is a little bit more than that quarter acre. The other half maybe is a little bit less than that quarter acre. Is that kind of what you're saying? Effectively. Effectively. Okay. I would say you're probably in good shape. We're not we're not talking about something really uh, precise here. You know, we're talking about something we're trying to get as close as we can to this quarter acre per hundred linear feet. I will say this though, if you have something that's really long on that, you know, part of that, the easy way to handle that would probably simply be to make it silt fence with backing. And then you've got a larger drainage area threshold and it's not, you're not so concerned about that quarter acre per hundred linear feet. So, 
Yeah, that's a good question. Anything else? Yes. Okay. Okay, so the live chat is turned on um, on the live stream. So if you do have questions online, feel free to chat and someone will get that to me. Oh, perfect. Okay. Okay, if you're not seeing the live chat, refresh your browser and you should see it. Okay. Thank you, Helen. All right. Check dams. Okay. Um, so I am going to uh, assume, because it's hard to see uh, on here, I'm going to assume right now for the purpose of this class, these are one foot contour intervals. Okay. So if you see a ditch graded in like this, how deep is that ditch? About six inches. It's less than a foot, right? Okay. So to show check dams, in that ditch, is that going to work? Well, you, you need to know how, how tall is the check dam, right? Because if you go back to the handbook, remember, we're always going back to the TDAC EPSC handbook for these objective guidelines. But the objective guidelines say that you need to be able to pass the design storm flow over the smiley face check dam spillway without overtopping the channel, right? That's the requirement. And if you go further into the TDEC EPSC handbook, you'll note that if you're gonna put a rock check dam in, it's a minimum one foot deep at the, from the invert of the spillway to the base of the check dam. And that smiley face on top, where water can flow over, is a minimum of nine inches according to the handbook. So your minimum depth for a check dam per the handbook is 21 inches tall, okay? So to put a 21 inch tall check dam in a six inch deep ditch does not work, right? A dumped pile of rock does not a check dam make. You ever heard that? <laughs> um, that's what this would look like. And so this is a frequent comment where a, a designer may have put a very nice check dam detail, sometimes the TDOT standard detail, which is fine. The TDEC handbook has one as well. Either one's fine, or you may have your own. But if you think about the size of the rock used in a check dam, it's often a minimum of what's called TDOT class A riprap, okay? Which can have stones that are all, all the way up to 15 inches in diameter. You know, all, you know, down much smaller than that, there's a range. But the point is, think about how deep the ditch is that you're specifying a check dam for. What would be a better alternative for something like this if you need check dams? Erosion eel, yeah, which is essentially, a, it's a name brand sediment tube. Or maybe... Uh, straw wattles maybe it's a really there's very little coming to this ditch and you just want something there temporarily that you can just let rot in place and vegetation grows in it because the other issue with rock check dams is you got to go in and pull them out and then restabilize so the, the encouragement here is just think about what how deep the ditch is that you're grading in we often find that if there's a typical section in the plans we don't see this as much. It's when there's not a typical section and the, the ditch is more or less relying on interpretation of the grading that there's almost this lack, it's, it's a disconnect or something like, it's not readily obvious how deep that ditch is unless you have that cross-section view of it, okay? Um, do you, let me say one more thing. When you're designing check dams and you're checking for capacity of that spillway, okay, the assumption, the underlying assumption is you're not accounting for water that's flowing through the check dam. You're assuming it's blinded. That's the way the handbook is set up. Okay, there you go. Okay, that's the way it's set up. Um, 
it doesn't mean you're calculating a peak flow rate for every single check dam. You're checking the last check dam at the bottom of the ditch. And if it works for that, it's going to work for all the ones upstream. Okay. Okay. Um, any questions about this? Okay. Sequencing notes. I know there's too many words in this page, but we're talking about notes. Um, so these are just some things that should be included on the plans. And um, we may, uh, that we haven't talked with Helen, maybe Christine talked to you about this, but there's actually been some discussion about setting up more standard notes with the city um, based on some of the more frequent comments that we've had. Um, but this first one, contractor to clear and grub what is needed only to install the initial EPSC measures uh, before this professional engineer EPSC certification and the initial city of Hendersonville inspection is done. You know, not just totally going out and starting construction, focus on getting those initial perimeter measures in, and then is when you start construction. That's, that's something that has been an issue uh, in the past, um, but that's, that's the process here, okay? The permit doesn't get issued until after those perimeter measures are installed, okay? Um, specific notes about the conversion of sediment basins during or uh, to detention ponds. Um, those of you who have taken the TDEC Level 2 course know I, I teach about this in that course. Um, and I've seen a variety of different, what I'll call conversion plans of taking a sediment basin to a detention basin. I've seen some really good examples and some plans that we've reviewed um, here for the city of Hendersonville. Um, but there continues to be, I think, some misunderstanding about this. And the, the best plans when it comes to communicating design intent about this are the ones that have two separate sets of details, one for the sediment basin and one for the detention basin. Or if they are the same, they've got really good explanatory notes about, you know, capping a bottom outlet during construction so that you can develop a permanent pool in the sediment basin. And some notes about when to remove that. You know, the timing of when you remove those things and convert this to a dry detention basin. That's critically important. Um, and it, it often results in some comments. Um, Notes about protection of stormwater control measures during construction, particularly green infrastructure type things. You know, how, once you install this bioretention area, how is it going to be protected from sediment as construction continues around it, uh, for example? And then stage to stage sequencing, um, you know, not dictating methods and means, but communicating design intent. And a good example of this is if you have a sediment basin or a sediment trap, that has contours on it that show it being filled in maybe in stage two. Stage one, you saw a sediment trap. Stage two, you see fill all in the sediment trap, but there's no notes about how that happens or how sediment is protected from running off the site during that filling process. That's the kind of thing that's missing. You know, we understand, I, I'm a designer too. To show three stages of EPSC plans they're just snapshots in time. You can't communicate everything in just those pictures. I know a picture's worth a thousand words, but you need more than a thousand words, okay? You, those are snapshots. And so having these notes that transition someone or a contractor from one stage to the next is really helpful. Um, and that, particularly when you're, you're filling in a sediment control practice, like a trap, but you're not saying, I've got to have silt fence, or I'm, I'm going to put something else out here to protect sediment from coming off during that filling process. So, okay. Um, I've kind of covered a lot of this already, and what I've kind of got ahead of myself. Um, let me, uh, I'll say this about the sediment basin details should provide elevations for the contractor. Um, yeah, don't rely on just a generic detail. Um, make it really clear what needs to be built because 
the contractor is not going to be looking at your drainage report. Um, and I'll say this too, be careful about what you show in the plans that you're not erring on the side of too much calculation detail that might get misinterpreted by the contractor. You know, it's kind of this happy medium where you got to supply enough to su support your design to the city, but then you also have to be cognizant of who's reading these plans and how might they misinterpret what you're presenting. Um, you know, recently we saw a set of plans where the top of sediment storage was called out as an elevation, as was the top of a principal spillway crest in the sediment basin. Well, sometimes those are the same, but these, it was calling out two different elevations. And so while it was, it was helpful for us as reviewers, it could be misinterpreted by the contractor as to how deep to build the sediment basin. So, um, stream determinations. This is just an example of a stream that was um, uh, not shown uh, in the plans, turned out to be a stream. And so what that does is it elicits not only a buffer, or if you're gonna cross it or discharge to it, the need for an aquatic resource alteration permit from TDEC, it also brings into question the floodplain ordinance and filling in that distance equal to twice the width of the stream on both sides. So in the floodplain ordinance, if you have a stream that's not mapped, there is still floodplain regulations surrounding it if you do any filling within a distance of twice the width of the stream on each side. So if you have a 10 foot wide unmapped stream, there's 20 feet on each side that you can't fill in, or you have to do a hydrologic and hydraulic study to prove that you're not increasing the flood elevation more than a foot. Okay. Um, and those, we've, we've seen a lot of back and forth with those types of situations. Yeah, that's the excerpt from the ordinance. Okay, let's let's round out with set, some sediment basin um, design. Oh, oops, there we go. We've seen some really good examples of this, but I just, for the purposes of review, while I had y'all here and on the live stream, these are just some key characteristics of a sediment basin per the TDEC EPSC handbook, okay? So you can see this four bay is designed to be dry storage. It's at or above the wet storage. And this is designed to be cleaned out after maybe every rain event when there's enough sediment accumulating there to save the storage of your wet storage so you don't have to go in and muck out the bottom permanent pool of the sediment basin so often, okay? Often we don't see this properly designed in a sediment basin design. This might be the same depth as the wet storage, and that doesn't accomplish the purpose of having an area upstream of your pond that is going to completely drain to make it easier to scoop out, okay? Um, the other thing that we often uh, come across is this two-year uh, or five-year design storm depth, okay? The idea behind this storm depth, when you route the storm through this pond, is to keep the level pretty shallow that's going to be overflowing your spillway because we're trying to create weird conditions of flow there, you know, to maintain more quiescent settling conditions in the pond. We've seen some that where this elevation may be two or three feet deep. And that, if you have two or three feet deep trying to get into the top of a pipe, you create the potential for a vortex, you're creating velocity currents towards that principal spillway, and it's not really providing the level of treatment that the handbook foresaw in, in how it's laid out, where it, you wanna limit that head over that principal spillway crest to maybe six, seven inches. So you kind of maintain weir flow, okay? Um, and then the 25 year, 24 hour storm, that needs to be going through an emergency spillway without overtopping the embankment, okay? And then you'll note <clears throat> these sediment storage requirements. Again, this is from the handbook. And this acre right here is per acre drained. It's not disturbed acreage. 
is total acreage. Okay. Um, and then this is just some other, it's a summary of requirements from the handbook. Just put there for you. And I can tell you some of the common things that we see, like I said, this recommended max six inches to maintain weir flow. That's a frequent comment where that's too deep and you're transitioning to orifice flow, which you don't want to do. Um, the emergency spillway is not properly designed. Um, and then sometimes there's not enough sediment storage provided. Okay. And finally, the, uh, let's see here. Oops. Huh. Okay. It's not showing up, but there's a minimum surface area requirement at that principal spillway crest. So the area at that level right there, the top of the dry storage, okay, has to be, um, it, it's based on the hydrology. And I apologize, I, I don't know what happened to this call out that I had. This is pretty key because we see this a lot. If you calculate 10 CFS draining to your sediment basin, what is the minimum surface area at the principal spillway crest? I'm asking the designers in the room, and yes, I'm putting you on the spot. Um, anybody know? What's the equation for that? Oh, come on, somebody. Okay. It's 0.1 acre. How did I get that? 10 CFS times 0 0.01, and then the answer is in acres. The units don't work out, it's just a relationship. That's how you can very quickly determine how much real estate should I be setting aside on this site for a sediment basin? Well, even if you just, you know, just do a quick, what's, what's about the flow rate I might expect at this outlet? If it's 10 CFS, 10 CFS times 0 0.01, 0 0.1 acre, okay? Now, as you can see, that's not the total area you're gonna need because there's freeboard here. You're gonna have to go up to that emergency spillway and then above that to the top of the embankment. So you need a little bit more than that, but at least that quick equation, it's also in the handbook, that's, that's where all this is coming from, that gives you a clue as to how much real estate to set aside, okay? And then these other minimums like the, uh, you know, this is all per the handbook, all these minimum diameters. Doesn't mean you have to use circular pipes stood on end for this, sometimes we've seen concrete square structures. That's totally fine. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay. I'm running out of time. Um, let me just see where we're at. Um, yeah, these are just common issues that we find with the sediment basin. Okay. And I'm not going to read every one of those, but these are common things, and I, I've said a lot of this already. I got ahead of myself. Uh, that surface area requirement not met, for example. Elevations not specified. Um, and then common calculation deficiencies. Not accounting for run-on drainage area. That's a big one. You have gotta account for all the run-on coming onto the site. Um, I've talked a lot about the sediment basin conversion. Okay, real quick, sufficiency review. This is just an example uh, of city, Helen Morrison sending, um, basically saying here, you need to do these things before we're gonna do the technical review, okay? And then this is a review timeline from initial submittal to permit. This was a real example. We're not naming names, so. But you can see August 5th to November 24th. Doesn't have to be that long. But there are, you know, this is a four review cycle example. Sometimes we have one review cycles. Very rarely, but sometimes, a lot of twos. Um, but they can, they can grow. That's all I've got. Any questions? Okay.
Well, thank y'all for listening. Well, thank you all for coming today. I know that there was a lot of great information in the slides, which I think if you all are okay, we'll send out to folks that registered, whether you're in person or online, and you can get all the links and all the resources and things like that. So um, thank you all for, for coming today. We look forward to hopefully seeing you again.